Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ram Fishman, my colleague and the deputy head of the MANA Center. Ram is from the Department of Public Policy here at Tel Aviv University. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, I uh, want to talk to you briefly about smallholder farmers and environmental sustainability. Um, so everybody in this room, I guess, knows that smallholder farmers still today form the majority of the world's poor. Um, and in developing countries, they actually dominate agriculture. They, they cultivate most of their land and produce a major shares of developing countries' food production. Um, and, and because of that, in the 20th century, the main challenge in economic development in the realm of agriculture was how do we increase the, help smallholder farmers increase their income, increase their production, in order for them to increase their income as a vehicle for economic development generally. That was the major challenge of the 20th century. And um, this is what the Green Revolution tried to do. And the Green Revolution was a great success, but uneven success, so geographically particularly. Um, as, as many of us know, the success of the Green Revolution was limited to basically Latin America and Asia, as you can see in this graph, where, which plots um, food output per capita in different regions of the world. But in particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, it never really happened. So it was a great success from a global perspective. It increased food production tremendously, including for smallholders, but mostly in Asia and Latin America. Another issue with the Green Revolution is that in those areas which were successful in achieving a Green Revolution, it often carried tremendous negative environmental impacts. The Green Revolution is a, is a technology that enables um, farmers to produce more by using more inputs, by using more water, more uh, pesticides, more uh, fertilizers, great success in producing more food, but the environmental impacts of this method of production where it has succeeded are getting more and more serious and we have evidence that they are actually becoming a major public health issue in countries like India and China. Um, and, and we know that um, the use of these inputs, inefficient, excessive use of these inputs is resulting in a scarcity of water, in pollution of water, Greenhouse gas emissions, globally agriculture is contributing up to a third of greenhouse gas emissions, um, land use, biodiversity, so it's becoming a major challenge for, for sustainability. And so the, in the 21st century, the challenge of smallholder agriculture is becoming more complex. In those areas which have not had the Green Revolution, we certainly need to spread similar technologies in order to increase production, increase incomes for the poor. But in areas where the Green Revolution was successful, even though further increases in yields are necessary, they have to be done in an increasingly more efficient and environmentally sustainable way for health reasons, for development reasons. And so this makes the challenge more nuanced and it, becomes, it creates um, a division between develop, agricultural development efforts in places without a Green Revolution like Sub-Saharan Africa and those in Asia and Latin America it's very obvious in the case of nitrogen fertilizer, for example. If you look at this map, if, if, this, if we were looking at this map, which shows the consumption, the, 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 the use of nitrogen fertilizer, orange colors indicate insufficient use with regard to in, Wherever you see uh, orange colors on this map, it means that the, the, est, the, the use, the actual use by farmers is insufficient to meet the cr crop's needs, and so yields are low. Whereas where, wherever you see green, it means that the application of nitrogen is excessive 
it is higher than what crops actually need, which results in runoff and pollution. And this map in 1960 would have been all orange, meaning insufficient use. But you see now that there is a lot of green, not only in Europe and the US, but the strongest greens are actually in some parts of India and in China, where there is excessive use of nitrogen fertilizer leading to a lot of pollution. So in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, we definitely need more use of more chemical inputs to boost production, whereas in some parts of, of Asia that we see in the dark green, we need to start figuring out how do we maintain and continue to increase yields while reducing the use of nitrogen fertilizers. Now, the good news is that we have technologies that can enable farmers to increase production while reducing the use of inputs such as water, fertilizer, pesticides. In many cases, those technologies exist. So it was good to see some discussion of the technologies this morning, including genetically modified crops that can achieve some of that. So that's an exciting front coming up ahead. But there are already technologies that exist and are not controversial in any way. <laughs> And, require, and, and, and then the challenge is how to get them adopted and used on a, on a wide scale. That's the challenge. And it's not so much a technical challenge, but it's more a human or economic challenge. So what are the factors? Why aren't these technologies being adopted on a large scale? So when it comes to technologies that increase yields, we, we are facing a similar challenge. Many technologies that are good for production are also not being adopted. And development economists have spent now maybe a couple of decades really studying that um, very intensively. So we don't have a lot of sufficient understanding of those barriers, but we know a lot. And we know that we have evidence that there are issues related to access to finance, to the risks smallholders are facing, to the difficulties of of accessing reliable information by smallholders that are preventing them from adapting technologies that increase production. But we know much less about technologies that not only increase production, but especially save inputs or make input use more efficient. That is something on which there is much less research. And it's probably that it's very likely that many of the same barriers that are stopping smallholders from adapting yield increasing technologies are also stopping them from adapting input saving technologies. But in addition to these factors, there are probably additional factors having to do with the fact that when we, it comes to environmental impacts, um, there are additional economic barriers, such as the fact that um, incentives are often misaligned. No individual, usually in the environmental context, has sufficient incentives to reduce their impact because their impact are a common property, a public good, common property resource. We all share the we all suffer from pollution equally, not only the polluter. We share water resources and so forth. So it's well known that in, in environmental economics, this is the basic idea that it's very hard to get people to, to act to reduce a global bad like pollution. So add all that to the problems that apply to the adoption of any technology, and you're facing a very complicated challenge when it comes to adopting input-saving agricultural technologies. Um, and then the big debate in policy is what should governments do? What should policy do to try to address this challenge? Um, here is, I have tried to caricaturize some of the prevailing views. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to offend some people so we get a debate going. The first approach that sometimes is advocated is forget all this chemical agriculture. Let's go back to traditional or, or highly alternative um, farming methods such as organic or permaculture is popularly mentioned. I don't want to go into it. I'll just mention that as far as I'm aware, we don't have any evidence that any of these approaches can actually on a large scale um, meet uh, global food uh, supply. And I'm sure some people in the audience disagree with that statement. So let's leave it for the discussion. The second approach is the one usually advocated by economists. All you have to do to get efficiency is to let markets work. Right now, um, markets don't work because they are distorted. What needs to be done is to remove all kinds of subsidies, all kinds of government interventions. Pollution needs to be taxed. And that will let markets reach the most efficient use. That will lead farmers to adapt the most efficient and input saving technologies. This is the point of view usually advocated by economists. But policymakers usually don't like getting the prices right. They like to subsidize. They like to be proactive. 
Um, many governments uh, subsidize chemical fertilizers like the Indian government or water supply in an attempt to encourage agriculture. And when the environmental harm of that uh, is becoming apparent, rather than removing the subsidies, they prefer to subsidize also the solution to these problems. Um, which, you know, most economists kind of don't like that, but show you some evidence that maybe it's more nuanced here. Finally, there's another point of view, which is basically saying there's nothing that policy needs to do. Scarcity by itself is going to generate the solutions and an appropriate response. As soon as farmers begin to experience the effects of scarcity, for example, water scarcity, automatically they will start adapting those technologies. And so this is an ongoing debate. It's often very ideological. It represents different ideological points of view. And what um, more empirical social scientists try to do is move the debate from, some, from a debate based on ideology to a debate based on evidence. So let me tell you about a few attempts to create such evidence. Um, I want to start with India, a country which is obviously very important in the global picture, uh, but facing a tremendous water challenge. In India, groundwater especially is very, very, is becoming increasingly scarce good. If you go to farmers anywhere in India, from experience, the number one complaint is we're lacking water. But the paradox is that even though water is very scarce and becoming increasingly scarce, it's being used extremely inefficiently. The great majority of Indian farmers still flood their field, which is technically a very inefficient way uh, to use water. So it's scarce but inefficiently used. And the question is how, what kind of policies can help move farmers from uh, flood irrigation, like the gentleman on the left, to, a, uh, to the use of technologies like micro-irrigation, obviously drip, sprinkler, which can substantially improve water use efficiency. So going back to this debate we just mentioned, there is a bunch of views out there. One is it's about prices. So the interesting thing in India, that water, as I mentioned, is, is subsidized. There is no pricing of water. Even the electricity farmers use to pump water is actually heavily subsidized. So they have every incentive to use as much water as they can. And many people think that's the core of the problem, that as soon as these subsidies would be removed, farmers would start using water more efficiently, adapt drip irrigation, and so forth. So um, I was involved in a project which tried to test this empirically in a real field experiment in the state of Gujarat, working with the government. We were able to implement an incentive for the first time that actually encourages farmers to save on water. And the surprising result was that it had no effect on how much water they use. So that's a challenge to this notion that just fixing prices will fix the, the problem. And I don't mean to claim that this is necessarily the sweeping answer to this question. We need more studies like this on a bigger scale. But it suggests that maybe in a, in a context of a developing country, rural area, prices by themselves may not do everything. Maybe more active interventions are needed. The other view, that scarcity by itself will just solve this problem, we also tested in the same area by using the fact that there is variation between uh, villages because of geological circumstances and how fast their water is depleted. So that's a natural experiment. And it allowed us to see experimentally, basically, how greater water scarcity translates to what farmers do. And what we found, and since then we replicated the same results in this different part of India, we found that in, instead of higher scarcity moving farmers to adapt water saving technologies, the response we do see is more abandonment of agriculture. So agriculture is shrinking and farmers are leaving agriculture rather than trying to adapt to greater scarcity by using more efficient water technologies. And that's very worrisome. Um, subsidies, do they work? The Indian government subsidizes drip irrigation. We have evidence from data that I don't have time to go into to show that subsidies do encourage adoption. But what's more interesting is adoption of a water saving technology does not necessarily lead people to use more water. And we use a lot of data that I don't have time to describe. The data actually tells you that post adoption of micro irrigation, water use doesn't actually go down, it actually goes up, at least in the short term. Farmers may not use the technology appropriately, and they may have incentives to actually use more water. This is sometimes called, um, uh, in, in, in electricity, an energy paradox or a rebound effect, where efficient technologies sometimes encourage people to use more of the resource. So it kind of goes back to the same choices that farmers make, as, as David discussed in the morning, that we need to understand. In the, in the case of nitrogen, big problem in India, you, the subsidy is very expensive. The Indian government is trying to do a lot to solve this problem. Here's the Prime Minister of India 
advocating a program of soil health cards that tell farmers how much nitrogen they actually need to apply. Unfortunately, when we conducted the experiment, um, this is actually supported by the MANA Center and the Mintz Institute, and uh, Yoav, who has led this study in the field, is here as a graduate student. We, again, didn't find any real effect on farmers' behavior, and it's not surprising, perhaps, that just giving them information without proper building of confidence will lead them to reduce. We uh, have similar results in other parts of India. It's very hard to get farmers to use less of a resource, um, even harder than getting them to adapt something that increases production. But it just, it, I would just, instead of forming a very pessimistic picture, it just happens to be that it's only the studies that I'm involved in that turn out to produce no results for some reason. Some <laughs> other researchers, which I'm very envious of, are actually finding impacts. For example, in Bangladesh, a study has found that letting farmers use color leaf charts, which tell them according to the color of the, of the, of the crop, how much nitrogen they need, actually did uh, reduce nitrogen use by 8%. So that's encouraging. There's a group in, in China, a very interesting group, that has been able on a very large scale to, um, and they're all uh, plant scientists. None of them are economists. But they've been able to, through engagement of farmers on a very large scale, they claim they have been able to um, also achieve a, a substantial reduction in nitrogen use while increasing yields. It's very interesting, I think, from a scientific um, from a disciplinary point of view, their methodologies would not have been accepted by an economics journal. But they're diving into this aspect, which is not pure plant science, and it's very interesting to see what they've done. I've actually seen their field site. So in conclusion, I want to just summarize by saying that we have a major challenge coming up where we need to continue to increase yields, but really improving the environmental efficiency of production, especially in places like India, China, some parts of Latin America, not in sub-Saharan Africa. I don't think that's our primary concern to use water or nitrogen fertilizer efficiently. Let's first get farmers to actually use these inputs there where yields are very low. And we need much more evidence to start to help us understand what kind of policies, what kind of interventions can help farmers make those choices. Thank you.